Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us on Crempton News First at Four. Whitney Ward will join us in just a little bit. While our education and warning approach has been relatively successful for individuals, the introduction of multiple parties involving 30 plus persons each poses an increased potential health risk to our community. So new at four o'clock, the Pullman chief of police is speaking out ahead of students starting their school year at Washington State University. Even though the university will start with all classes online, some students are moving back to Pullman. There is a concern for community health with large parties being thrown without any coronavirus precautions in place. Our Tim Pham is live in the newsroom with the Pullman Police Department's plan on how to keep Pullman healthy. Tim. Well, thousands of WSU students are expected to return to Pullman by Monday, and today Police Chief Gary Jenkins announced what approach the police department will take with addressing people who violate the proclamation. Officers will not be patrolling to look for individuals that are violating those uh, uh, proclamations, but they have been taking education and warning approach. But now we'll focus on large gatherings in violation of the mandates. We will focus instead our efforts on parties that present the greatest potential impact to public health. According to Chief Jenkins, so far officers have responded to approximately a dozen complaints about parties at houses and apartments, with most of the complaints coming from College Hill, where WSU's Greek Row is located. Most of the parties have exceeded the gathering size limit. No one has been wearing face masks and there was no social distancing. Pullman is in phase three of the state's reopening plan. Under phase three, gatherings are not allowed to exceed 10 people. Mask enforcement will only happen after a complaint is received and that person does not comply, following education and, of course, some warning. According to Chief Jenkins, no one should be receiving jail time for violations, but at extreme circumstances, violations can result in fines and jail time. So we'll keep an eye on that for you. And of course, we are speaking about Washington State University. They are welcoming their newest Cougs. In today's convocation, students, faculty, and staff shared encouraging messages to help students get off to a great start. This comes as WSU is starting the semester with only online classes. We are a community of Cougs helping Cougs, and we live by that creed. This is your time and your experience, and it is up to you to mold it the way you want it to be. Well, the school said it will be prepared to return to all in-person learning whenever it might be safe to do so. Well, the Coeur d'Alene Marathon is officially getting started today, but instead of just a one-day event, it's going to be spread out here over the next three days of this entire weekend. Participants will either be running a marathon or their choice of a shorter distance run. So organizers are taking precautions right now with COVID-19, of course. This year, they've made a lot of significant changes. Creme 2's Amanda Rowley is joining us live now from McEwen Park with the latest on this year's event. Amanda? Well, this year is going to be much different than the years past for the Coeur d'Alene Marathon, where we saw thousands of runners and people in the streets. For example, a few of those changes include runners will be starting at the blue arch just over yonder and then finishing here at the green arch. Now, COVID, those are just one of the few COVID-19 precautions in place. In addition to that, every five minutes, only eight runners can begin racing at a time for their respective distance that they'll be running. Now, joining me this evening is race director Ryan Height, and he's going to be stepping in from a social distance. But one of the questions we're going to ask, I guess, so the race starts here at 430 and wanted to hear what sort of response you've heard from runners starting to get ready and, and prep for the race starting here in about half an hour. Yeah, great question. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, in general, the runners have, uh, they've been pretty excited. You know, it's, uh, it's been several months now since any race has happened. And, uh, you know, really since March, a lot of runners have had races canceled, including a lot of the big ones, you know, Boston Marathon, uh, obviously Bloomsday went virtual, some of those things. So I think runners in general are excited to get out and be able to race again. Although it's going to look different, uh, they're excited to step up to the starting line and get to cross a real finish line. So. 
And Ryan, you uh, talking a little bit earlier, you had maybe a couple weeks to really pull this off. And this, like you mentioned, this is one of the big events that are still uh, being hosted despite COVID-19 restrictions. So what does that mean for your organization? And, and what was maybe that determining factor to pull this off even with those restrictions? Yeah, good question. You know, we've we've really worked very hard um, with uh, Panhandle Health uh, and, and the health department, the city of Coeur d'Alene. Uh, I will give them uh, kudos. They've been really good to work with and that I think this is an easy time for, you know, a lot of health departments and uh, government municipalities to basically just make a Blake and answer of no. And they were very receptive to working with us and trying to come up with strategies that would work for an event of this type and this scale here in Coeur d'Alene. So we're very excited. Well, thank you so much, Ryan. Again, that race starts at 430. We'll be posting up here, hoping to talk to a few runners who are going to be starting up here. Again, those five minute intervals, just eight runners at a time. Reporting in Coeur d'Alene, Amanda Rowley, Krim 2 News. Well, there's also good news for residents of Idaho because Idaho is staying in stage four of the state's reopening plan. Governor Brad Little made the announcement today in today's press conference. The state will remain in stage four for at least two more weeks. Governor Little did say, though, that the number of hospital admissions and suspected and confirmed coronavirus cases in Idaho is higher than they would like to see. The counties that are hot spots include Kootenai, Canyon, Ada, Bonneville and Twin Falls. Currently, all of Idaho except for Ada County is in stage four. Ada County, which has seen the highest number of coronavirus cases, remains in stage three. Now under stage three, bars and nightclubs must remain closed. Under stage four, more businesses are open, but with restrictions that include social distancing protocols. In more positive news for the state, Governor Little said that metrics from the last two weeks continue to improve. We're seeing downward trend in overall confirmed cases, test positivity rates, and emergency department visits of patients with COVID-like illnesses. Governor Little also announced two and a half million dollars in coronavirus relief funds have been allocated to the Idaho Food Bank. The Food Bank is adding 15 new community distribution sites to help families during this pandemic. The governor will make his next announcement on the state's reopening plan on September 4th. Spokane County here in Washington currently remains in phase two of reopening. Well, starting on Monday, classes are back in session for the University of Idaho, but certainly things are going to look very different for the Vandals as we go into this year. Starting with all students there on the Moscow campus, they do have to test negative for COVID-19 before they can ever walk into a class in person. Faculty and staff are strongly encouraged to participate in testing as well. And today is the last day for student testing. Faculty and staff, though, will get tested next Monday. That will continue through Wednesday. The university's own lab has actually tested over 23,000 people, 34 have tested positive. And a few other things to know, students who refuse to wear a face covering will be asked to leave campus. PPE kits will be provided for all faculty, staff and students. And classroom capacity is going to be capped at 50%. Faculty though, instead of wearing a face covering, they can also wear a face shield. Students and faculty, though, should be ready to shift to online learning if there is a coronavirus outbreak on campus. And we do want to make sure that you have the latest back to school information wherever you are. So we want to make sure that you know all you have to do is text school to 509-448-2000. We'll send you a link with the most up to date information. <laughs> all right, sending things back to Tom now as we take a look at weather. Kind of been an up and down even day here, especially on the north side. We started out cloudy. Mm -hmm. Now it's getting sunny and warm. Seems like that might be kind of the theme here for the next couple of days, Tom. Yeah, we've got a cool front that's moving in uh, this evening and overnight, Whitney. It's going to bring us some gusty winds, uh, but it'll bring us uh, seasonal temperatures on Saturday as we saw temperatures today climb into the mid to upper 80s. By the way, blowing dust is a real possibility for tonight and in the overnight hours. 87 degrees right now in Spokane, 91 out in Moses Lake. You can see temperatures down in Pullman are at 84 in Moscow, Idaho. Right now checks in with a current temperature of 82 degrees. That's a look at the 
satellite and radar picture. Look at the rain over on the west side of the state. Again, that's part of the cool front that will usher in temperatures much cooler than what we're seeing here uh, in the Pacific Northwest. You can see the showers uh, making it just to the east slopes of the Cascades, but most of it, of course, is in western Washington. We'll look for windy areas tonight. I mentioned the blowing dust will go from 80s to an overnight low of 58. Sunny and warm tomorrow, a bit on the breezy side. We'll see a daytime high of 81. Is that just about perfect for this time of year? And then for Sunday, it warms up a bit. We'll look for a daytime high of 89 degrees. The rest of your seven day forecast is just minutes away. Whitney. Seems pretty good to me, Tom. Thank you very much. As always, we are keeping an eye on all the wildfires burning here across our region. There is a wildfire burning in northern Okanagan County right now, sitting at more than 11,000 acres burned. Level 2 and Level 3 evacuations are in place for this one. We're talking about the Palmer Fire right now. Hundreds of people are now being forced to flee from their homes. According to DNR, at least 30 structures have been lost. About 400 crew members are out there working to put it out right now. Okanagan County Emergency Management reports this fire is 0% contained. Also, level three evacuations in place for Wanaka Lake Road. That's from Washburn to Elamiham Mountain Road. It's also for Totes Cooley Road to Chapaca Road. That's along the Loomis Oroville Road area. Level three means those people need to get out right now. Level two evacuations are also in place from Ellis Barnes Road to Loomis Oroville Road. And remember, level two means you need to be prepared to leave at a moment's notice. Again, we're told at least 86 structures are threatened right this minute.